Okay, uh, welcome everybody to Tuesday Night Men's Bible Study. My name is Steve Kyle. Uh, I have the privilege of being an elder here at the bridge and of sharing God's Word tonight, which is always a privilege. Um, let's pray to start, and then we're going to look at Micah chapter 4. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your goodness to us in preserving your Word to us over mm, 30 centuries or so. Thank you for um, it being our rule book, for you allowing us to learn, for uh, Holy Spirit in us instructing us as we study. Thank you for these men and for their willingness to be here and set aside time to study your word together. Um, we pray, Heavenly Father, that your word for us is um, like you say in Isaiah 55, it does not return void, that it is Hebrews 4, 12 talks about it is quick and powerful, and that we regard it that way, that we rise to the level of your word, and we don't bring your word down to our level. Uh, thank you so much for your goodness to us, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Okay, Micah chapter 4, um, I don't, I think, well, a couple of introductory things, just sort of by way of background. Um, you saw this diagram last week, but just as a reminder... Um, so, Micah is over in this area in what is called the divided monarchy, Israel and Judah, and it's before the fall of Samaria. Chronologically, that's when he is. And this next one was the one you couldn't read very well, and I hope you can read this a little better. I tried to enlarge it some. Um, you can, the prophets, of which Micah is one, are listed in the middle in the little yellow squares. And you can see Micah's about in the middle. He's just below Isaiah. Again, if you can read that. Isaiah and Micah, probably for at least a portion of their ministries, were co coincided. They were, they were at roughly at the same time. In fact, what we're going to read tonight um, in Micah chapter 4 and some of the later <coughs> parts of Micah also, very similar, verbally, very similar prophecies that occur in the book of Isaiah. Um, in any case, you can see where uh, Michael was on the left are the kings of Judah. Again, we've got the divided monarchy. You know, Judah, uh, Israel, northern ten tribes, Judah, southern two tribes. So the kings of Judah are on the left, and Michael's time was, and it says at the beginning of the book, he dates himself. Although it says he prophesied to both Samaria and Jerusalem, which means he was prophesying to both north and south. Samaria was up north, Jerusalem was down south. Jerusalem was a the kingdom of the southern, of the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, Samaria was the uh, capital of the northern kingdom. And we're not going to go into some of these things that we looked at last week regarding the idolatry that was still very present in both of those places, which we read about last week. It's why everything was going to happen to, you know, Micah said, this is all going to be a, a heap of baloney because of the idolatry you all have continued to promote. Um, in any case, just as a side light, um, if you, as you read the Old Testament, the little asterisks, it, so there's a listing of kings on the left and on the right. There are little asterisks behind some of the kings' names. And those are the good ones. <laughs> no, I'm serious. That's what they're there for. Those were, the, the Old Testament testifies in the record of that king's works, that king's rule, that they were good kings, that they endeavored to um, promote the worship of the one true God. The, the ones that don't have the little asterisks um, were bad kings. And I mean, we're talking like, and we read it last week, like Jeroboam on the right, the northern of the northern, the first king of the northern um, tribe, of uh, the northern kingdom. And you'll notice, <laughs> you'll notice with the northern kingdom, there are no asterisks at all. <laughs> Okay, so Jeroboam, which we read last week. Oh, shoot. 1 Kings 2, 28. Anyway, he actually set up golden calves. He said, you know, I'm going to lose my kingdom if those guys, if the people up in my northern part of the country keep going down to Jerusalem to worship, which they always had to do, of course. There were the feasts they had to do. He said, so we're just going to have them stamp here. So he set up golden calves in Samaria. Behold thy God, though, Israel, that brought you out of Egypt. That was Jeroboam, the very first king of the northern kingdom. Okay. So, it did, and it just gets worse from there, because the idolatry continues. And that is why Micah chapter 3 that we read about, 
It's going to all be uh, a heap of rubble. It's all going to be gone. So, in, with that little bit of background, and that um, we're not going to get into some of these kings and what they actually did, like Ahaz during Micah's era. Ahaz was not a good king of the southern tribe of Judah. The three kings that are listed in Micah's time over on the right with the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, none of them were good. So this is the backdrop against which he is prophesying. Right? I mean, we're talking about flat out idolatry here. So, I'll uh, give you a little bit more background on Micah. And, and we're not going to really examine this, but when you read these prophets, you got to think about these guys were taking their lives in their hands, man. <laughs> they were saying things that nobody liked. And they were taking their lives in their hands to do it. And sometimes they lost them because of it. Um, anyway, so let's just read Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 3 um, was more reproof of leadership, if you remember, of prophets, priests, leaders of the people. It was reproof. It was essentially what they were doing wrong and so forth and what was going to happen. Um, chapter 4, we'll see, is prophetic, both sort of both good and bad. It's what is going to happen to Israel, both the better part and the not so good part. But I want to point out, this is a, you may remember um, Pastor David uh, saying at one point or another that chapter divisions in your Bibles are not um, divinely inspired. They're not part of the original revelation, so to speak. This is an instance where the chapter division is not a good one. Because if you look at Micah chapter 4 verse 1, it says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house... Just that phrase, mountain of the house, right? So what it is talking about is the exaltation of the mountain of the house, which is the temple mount. That is what the mountain of the house is. It's the temple mount. So chapter 4, first 11 verses or so, are talking about the exaltation of that temple mount and what is going to happen when it is truly exalted as God's going to have it exalted. But it's in contrast to what happens in chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore shall Zion for your sake... Be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. So the Temple Mount, according to chapter 3, verse 12, is going to become just overgrown like a forest. It's going to be nothing, right? But then, chapter 4, verse 1, we see where it is going to be exalted. So it's in contrast. That's not a great chapter division, because chapter 4, verse 1 is really in direct contrast to chapter 3, verse 12. So we're just going to read now. And if... Somebody would like to read it in a more modern translation. I don't have a new King James with me, so I can read in King James. <clears throat> but uh, would anybody like to read if you have a more modern translation? I'll uh, read King James. Okay, yeah, that, okay. yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. And now, if you're if you're up to it, go ahead and read all thirteen verses of chapter four. Which one can read from? New King James. Michael, New King James. Yeah, Michael chapter four, New King James. Yeah. Uh -huh. Michael four one. Um, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and, he shall walk in his, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall lift up sword against nation. Neither they shall learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God. But we walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the land. I will gather the outcasts and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. For the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion. And from now on, even forever. And you, O Cairo of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, you shall come. Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? 
Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pains that seize you like a woman in labor, be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pains. For now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go. There you shall be delivered, there the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now also many nations have gathered against you, who say, Let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. For he will gather them like sheaves of the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron. I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples. I will consecrate their gain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. Thank you. So we see from chapter 4, verse 1, down through verse 8, is a prophecy of what is, Israel is going to be when God elevates the Temple Mount, that Zion is once again a kingdom, and that they are His people. And then from verse 9, How was the, dost thou cry aloud? Verses 9 through, uh, well, following actually, until verse... 12, yeah, yeah. 9 through 11 talk about the captivity and specifically prophesies in verse 10, uh, but it be in pain and labor to bring forth, for now shalt thou go forth out of the city, thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. So foretelling the Babylonian captivity. It was going to be 70 years there before God brought them back. You may remember the quote that many people verse that many people memorize, Jeremiah 29, 11. Anybody have that verse memorized? Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. Right? That's about the Babylonian captivity. The plans, what it says just before that verse is, in 70 years I'll come and get you. And those are the plans that Jeremiah 29, 11 refers to. Not that it's a bad verse to memorize. However, it is spoken in reference to the fact that they were in captivity and He would bring them out. <laughs> and a lot of people, I think, when they memorize that verse, remove it from its context. I'll just put it that way. Remove it from its context. Because the plan was, you're going to stay in captivity because you're a bunch of idiots. And I'll get you out in seven years. Because that's really what happened. And that's what this is foretelling as well, about when in captivity. And then in verses 12 and 13, once again, um, he says he's going to gather the enemy countries like sheaves. And you may know the, um, the metaphor of um, threshing, the biblical metaphor of threshing. They'd have a stone in a high place where there was good wind across it. They'd put wheat or whatever down on the floor, that on, on, the, on the rock. They would have oxen tread it out. They'd tie it to a central line. They'd just have them walk in a circle to separate the kernels from the chaff. And then they would take something like a shovel, whatever they would have, and they would, or, and they would throw it up in the air. They would throw a whole bundle of stuff up in the air, just handful after handful, and the chaff would blow away, and the wheat would fall to the ground. And that's how they separated the wheat from the chaff. When the Bible talks about separating wheat from chaff, that's what it's talking about. And in verse 13, he specifically says that Zion is the one that's going to do the threshing when God exalts them. He says, arise and thresh. I'm going to gather these countries that are against you, just like sheaves. They're going to go on the threshing floor. They're going to be tread out. Just arise and thresh. Right? He says, I'm going to make your, that says bronze, but the King James says brass. I'm going to make your hooves brass. It was the, the oxen's hooves that hidden on the rock that separated the wheat from the chaff. And then the wind blew the chaff away. So that's the, the analogy, the metaphor that he's using. Um, so Micah chapter 4 is, um, and just as a sidelight, not really sidelight, in the last days, typically points to the days of Messiah, although Messiah is not specifically mentioned here. Typically that is the time frame that that a reference talks about. We talked about those three things. And then let's look at Romans chapter 10 verse 25. When we read these prophecies in the Old Testament, Read prophecies about um, 
Israel, Romans chapter 10. It is easy to think that they are no longer relevant. That they're no longer, that, no, that God is no longer interested in Israel or that these prophecies will not come true. It's easy for people to fall into that. But if you understand these prophecies in the context of Romans chapter 10, verse 25, uh, I'm sorry, 11, verse 25. I got the wrong chapter. 11, verse 25. Of course. Mine didn't go that far. Yeah, really. <laughs> you don't have that in your Bible? Yeah. Um, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, just want to point out the fact that we are still in that time frame of the fullness of the Gentiles. Because Israel is not exalted like we read about in Micah chapter 4 yet. Um, when that's going to end, don't know. But when Israel is exalted, there won't be any question. <laughs> there won't be any question in anybody's mind at all. Um, nobody will have to argue about whether that was what happened at that certain date or not. It will be obvious to everybody. Um, so, again, those prophecies, um, there's, they're relevant. They're viable. God is going to honor them. But He's going to honor them on His timetable. Not on what we think His timetable should be. So, in reading this uh, Micah chapter 4, I just thought about the purpose of prophecy because as Christians now looking back at these things looking back at New Testament writings and for most people I think, for most Christians to the degree that, and I'm, I'm not saying this derogatorily but honestly most Christians don't read the Bible, number one True. if they read the Bible, they don't understand the Bible number two, or simply remember what they read, which is probably the first step in understanding it Number three, if they read the Bible, they pretty much read the New Testament. And that's not a bad thing. Any, reading any of God's Word is better than, than nothing, of course. Um, but as I was thinking about Christians and prophecy, in the New Testament, really, other than Matthew 24, um, well, let, let's look at, just thinking about the purpose of prophecy. Remember we talked about previously um, that prophecy is either foretelling Simply speaking God's word, or forthtelling, you know, speaking God, or foretelling, telling the future, or forthtelling, speaking God's word. It is not always foretelling. It is not always saying something that's going to happen in the future, right? So it can either be foretelling or forthtelling. And when it is foretelling, when it is talking about future events, it has to fit the purpose of it. it has to fit in the context of. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. How many people have memorized that? Let's say it together. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is, uh, I know the King James. Tom knows the new King James because he's the SOD guy. <laughs> <laughs> All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Um, now, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, leaves King James unto all good works. So, the purpose of prophecy has to fit into all scripture is profitable for doctrine, and proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Right? That's the purpose of prophecy. And as I was thinking about New Testament prophecy, of which there frankly aren't that many, we'll talk about that as well. Um, prophecy falls into the category, it's, these are my designations. I mean, you, as you, your understanding of prophecy biblically, you may have um, a different take on it, you know, a different slant. But as I see prophecy in the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, primarily it's either a proof, it's a warning, like we read in Micah chapter 3, this is what you're not supposed to do, okay? And getting back to what you are supposed to do, so it's a reproof, it's a warning that you're wrong. Or it's doctrine about something we're supposed to believe correctly, about a certain event, for example, in the New Testament. And if you think about this, um, if you think about this, there are only there, there's not that much foretelling in the New Testament. There's the book of Revelation, which talks about future events. There's Matthew chapter 24 and parables, where Jesus talks about things leading up to his return, a portion of his return. And there's 
1 Corinthians 15, talking about the return of Christ, that's a future event. 1 Thessalonians 4, that talks about the return of Christ, that's a future event. There are a couple of other isolated instances, like Agabus in Acts 21, when he talks about Paul's going to be bound in Jerusalem. You know, he takes the guy's girdle and he bounds it, binds his hands and feet, and he says, the person that owns this girdle is going to be bound in Jerusalem. So that was a, a future event. And there are probably isolated others that I just don't recall. But there are not a lot more than that in the New Testament. Not like in the Old Testament. There really, there are lots of prophecies cited in the New Testament, but it's because they were fulfilled by Christ. Not because, I mean, not because they're still future events, it's because they were fulfilled. So, as I thought about the purpose of prophecy, like we read in Micah chapter 4, prophecies that would... Um, that we would be more familiar with. Those prophecies really fall into the category of either reproof, a warning, or what you're supposed to believe in the doctrine, what you're supposed to believe about a certain event. Um, and the reason I thought about this, and actually sort of think about it a lot, is that Christians nowadays are overtaken with end times. They're overtaken with foretelling types of prophecy. They're preoccupied with it to the point that it, frankly, affects normal Christian living. Um, which is the whole purpose of the doctrine of a prophecy or the reproof of a prophecy in the first place. The, the, the purpose of it is to get you to be a better Christian. <laughs> Not to be preoccupied with who's going to be involved in the happening, when exactly it's going to happen, because those just become preoccupations. Now, uh, I'm stating my viewpoint. I'm not saying you have to believe what I say. I mean, I, I encourage you, just like 2 Timothy 2.15 talks about, study to show thyself approved unto God, work with the need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's your job, right? Mm -hmm. Just because I say it doesn't mean it's true. If, if I show you in Scripture, then it's your job to see yeah, I agree. That looks like it's true from God's Word. But if you don't do that, that's your fault. That's not mine. So what I'm saying to you is my biblical perspective on this. As an example of this whole preoccupation with last days, whether we're in the last days or not. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 17. So in the King James, which should be probably similar in any translation you're reading, Acts 2.17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, etc. etc. Okay, so it says, It shall come to pass in the last days. Okay, so this is a quotation from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. Look at Joel. This is going to be a little bit of page flipping. And especially those books that you make may not be real familiar with. <clears throat> um, and for you, people that are using electronic media, you're cheating. However, that's fine. <laughs> My mom was in the truck. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. It is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Joel chapter 2, uh, verse. we're going to read just the first couple of phrases of, of verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Okay, now, that says afterward, right? Joel chapter 2 says afterward. What did the quotation of that passage in Acts 2 say? Should come to pass in the last days. In the last days. Right, now, the point being, Peter is speaking by revelation, inspiration, in Acts chapter 2. The first sermon in the Christian church. He's speaking by revelation. And he's citing Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32. And he changes the words. He doesn't say afterward. He says, in the last days. And the quotation applies to what happened on that day. The tongues. He's explaining it to them. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That's what he says. This is that. It shall come to pass in the last days. Do you see that by him quoting that that way, and by inspiration, changing afterward to in the last days, that he put us in the last days? 
Do you understand that? Do you understand that? He put us in the last days because he said that event happened in the last days. It's what he just said. The point being, we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. Now, I'm not saying there aren't going to be recognizable events, perhaps, leading up to the actual return of Christ. I'm not saying that. But I'm also saying that no reason to be preoccupied about it because it's been the last days for a long time. Because of what Peter said. <clears throat> um, so, to demonstrate this a little bit, I, I actually had to research this a little bit just to be sure I was correct. And I'm not great with Hebrew. Um, I'm pretty good with Greek, but I'm not great with Hebrew. I'm working on that, so I, I can't just read Hebrew. So, the closest I could get to a good literal rendering of the Hebrew text of Joel 2.28 is what's called Young's Literal Translation. It's up on the screen now. And it says, And it, and it hath come to pass afterwards, I do pour out my spirit on all flesh. So, it's afterwards. Right? That guy translates it literally. The Greek Old Testament is called, the, you may have heard it called the Septuagint. Right? It's called the Septuagint. So this guy, Brenton, did a translation of the Septuagint, of the, of the, of the uh, an English translation of the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. So he's translating it and it shall come to pass afterward. So the Hebrew says afterward. The Greek Old Testament says afterward. right? But when we get to, as we saw, Acts 2.17, and it shall come to pass in the last days. So Peter changes the scripture by inspiration in the Old Testament. By inspiration, he changes it when he applies it, that prophecy in the New Testament, to that event. So, point B. We've been in the last days a long time. Because they started with the times of Messiah, when Jesus was on the earth. Right? They started a little time ago. Not, again, that there aren't certain events. I'm not saying that. I'm only saying, I don't think we can be preoccupied with it. Now we'll go on a little more. And again, we're talking about just the general purpose of prophecy. Remember, it's either doctrine, what we're supposed to believe about a certain event, in the context of 2 Timothy 3.16. It's either doctrine, what we're supposed to believe, or reproof. You're not doing right, you need to get back. One of the two. Because that's the purpose of all scripture. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That's the purpose. Okay, so we talked about the prophecies in the New Testament, Matthew 24, the Revelation of John, 1 Thessalonians, we'll probably look at those. Um, other isolated instances, again, I'm, this is not exhaustive. I mean, I'm not an expert on prophecy. Don't misunderstand me. But generally speaking, I think that covers most prophecy in the New that is foretelling prophecy in the New Testament. Um, so let's um, I'm gonna hand something out to you here. I only made one of you is probably gonna have to share this look on because I only made five. Um, they're front and back, and once you get the piece of paper, we'll talk about it briefly. But two of you that are sitting kind of close, if you could look on one together, man. And, and it's, they're, they're front and back, and you'll want good light to look at it. So you guys in the back row, you might want to move up to the next row, maybe, just to be able to see a little better. I didn't print it small, that's the way it was. But once you get the piece of paper and you're looking at it, then we'll talk about it a little bit. And this is why I think Christianity becomes preoccupied with the last days and with future events. Okay, so that listing that you have in your hand is a listing of dates that have been specifically stated when Jesus was going to return. Right? Now, the first one you'll notice is in 500 AD. When, then, when um, it was proposed that Jesus was going to return on a certain date in 500 AD. That handout is, uh, I think, seven pages long leading up to and into the future with dates designated all the way up into 2057. Specific day when Jesus is supposed to come back. Okay, so what's the important part of prophecy, right? So we have the prophecies in Matthew 24. We have the prophecies in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15 about the return of Christ. What's the important part of that prophecy? 
be ready for winning times? What'd you say, be ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right, to be ready. Um, one of the parallels to Matthew 24, if you'll take your Bibles, and, and you can look through this. This is a really interesting, and this is Wikipedia. I mean, this is not nothing complex or theological. This is a list on Wikipedia of all the dates that have been projected. And you'll notice there are dates. There was a date, September 25th, 2018. A guy propounding that Jesus was going to return on that day. There's another one in 2019. That Jesus is going to return on a certain day. And they have this elaborate reasoning for why this is going to happen. So this has been going on for like 1,500 years now. Right? Since 500 when the first one was proposed. So it's nothing but preoccupation with the wrong part of the prophecy in the first place. Um, look at Mark chapter 13. One of the parallels to Matthew 24 is in Mark 13. And I think this is at the end of <laughs> the prophecies. <laughs> this is at the end of the prophecies when Jesus talks about, you know, when the di disciples ask him, you know, what are going to be the signs? What are the events? What are the signs of your coming? Then he talks about stuff that's going to happen. And then he ends that by saying in Mark 13, 32. But of that day <clears throat> and that hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So, okay, so Jesus says all that stuff, and then he says, I don't know when this is going to happen. So why would we, we be preoccupied with that? If he doesn't know, for heaven's sake, how are we ever going to know? But we've been predicting it since 500 A.D. Right? Um, even later in New Testament, even after the uh, resurrection. Look at uh, Acts chapter 1. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. And these are the disciples, for heaven's sake. I mean, these are his chosen guys. The people that are going to take over when he ascends. It's going to be their gig. Right? Acts chapter 1. Just before the ascension. So, uh, in verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, that is a hint as to what kind of Messiah the disciples themselves expected Jesus to be. They expected him to be the mighty Davidic kingdom was going to come back again. And Messiah was going to conquer Rome. And Israel was going to be like we read about in Micah chapter 4. The first few verses. The mountain of the house was going to be above all the mountains. That's what they expected. But that wasn't the Messiah Jesus was. But he still has to correct them right before he's going to go to heaven. Right? They still ask that question. Lord, are you going to restore again the kingdom of Israel now? I mean, is it time? And what's his reply to that in verse 7? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Once again, who knows about this? Only the Father, not the Son. So when you see a listing like that from Wikipedia, I would have to conclude that we're preoccupied with time when we have no business being preoccupied with time. Because Jesus told us from the start, he doesn't know. So why would we be preoccupied with time? The important part of the prophecy is reproof. That is to say, like, like uh, you said, when if you're not ready for the return of Christ, you need to get ready for the return of Christ, right? Uh, first, look at First John chapter two. First John chapter two, um, verse twenty. 1 John 2, 28, And now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So, <clears throat> the biggest reason that um, God, by way of Paul's revelation in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, told us about the return of Christ, is so that we can be ready at all times. Right? Because he's going to come back any time. I don't, I don't think about this nearly enough. I don't think about the fact that I am going to meet Jesus in the clouds, according to 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, if I am alive when he comes. I'm going to be resurrected from the dead if I am dead when he comes. I don't think about that enough. 
Because that in itself, that is what motivated Paul for 30 years to risk his life to spread God's word. He was still, he still believed he would see Jesus in his bodily, in his flesh, when he was about to be martyred in 2 Timothy. He still believed that, and he believed it his whole life. That's what motivated him. I don't think about that enough. But Jesus is going to come back any time. Any time. But the devil, of course, is going to get people... Look at 1 Corinthians 15. But the devil, of course, is going to get people preoccupied and distracted by trying to find out, based on some mysterious, complex formula, when Jesus is coming back. And if you read some of those descriptions of those dates, not now, but if you take it home with you, if you just look at some of those, they are so ridiculous. And yet, people believe them. And like, sold possessions and went out to... Oh my goodness, it was just, it's just ridiculous. But the devil gets people preoccupied with the wrong part of the prophecy. The part of the prophecy that's important is you're going to see him face to face. I don't care when it is. And you shouldn't either. The point is, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen any time. And you better be ready. Yeah, exactly. And you better be ready. So the point is Christian living. It's not predict when he's coming back and let's see if we're right. Like we've been doing for the last 1,500 years. So, let look at uh, both what's a kicker about this is uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, let's see. In verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, I only want to point that out because just like the devil wants to preoccupy people with the wrong part of the prophecy, getting them distracted by when it's going to happen, versus being ready. Right? Um, in Corinth, now, Corinthians was written during Paul's third missionary journey. It was written right in the neighborhood of about between 49 and 51 AD. Who knows when Jesus died? When was he crucified? Do you know? 33 30, 33 AD. That's right, 33. So, from 33 AD, when he was crucified, to about, let's say in round figures, 50 AD. How many years is that? 17. 17. So by 17 years later, after the empty tomb, people are saying there's no resurrection. In the early church. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. That's exactly right. They're saying, there's no resurrection. What are you talking about? It's happened, it happened, the, the eyewitnesses, he talks about previous verses here, right here. Let's see, um, right here. Let's see. I delivered unto you, verse 3, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, rose again, third day, according to the scriptures. He was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. So, the majority of 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection were still alive. And there are people saying there's no resurrection. <laughs> so the devil's going to try to steal this prophetic truth, this, this great motivator in the New Testament, this prophetic motivator of Christ's return. He's going to try to steal it or corrupt it any way that he can. And he tried right after it happened. <laughs> there's no resurrection, but I saw it. <laughs> so it's almost like a say you don't believe me in your mind. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the important parts of a prophecy are the reproof, you know, a warning. If it's a reproof, then you're doing this wrong. You need to get back. Or it's doctrine that is what we're actually supposed to believe about a certain event. Um, we're not going to get into the whole pre-trip, post-trip thing tonight. But the point is. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, there are certain things we're supposed to believe about the return of Christ and what's going to happen to us as believers, which is what it says, whether we're alive or dead, what's going to happen at that return, and that we're going to see Him face to face. Okay? We are going to see Him face to face, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then 1 Thessalonians 4 says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
This is our comfort in the face of death, because that's what he talks about. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. We don't sorrow having no hope. It's not that we don't sorrow. Of course I'm sorry somebody passes, a dear one of mine, of course. But I don't sorrow because I'm never going to, if they were Christians and I'm a Christian, I'm going to see them again. I don't sorrow like somebody who's never going to see that person again, who's got six feet and a hole in the ground. That's it. You know? That's all. So the important part of the prophecy is either the doctrine or the proof, and not the timing. <laughs> Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And again, I thought of all these things just in the context of Micah chapter 4. Those are future prophecies. I don't know when God's going to exalt Israel again. I don't know. I know that according to Romans 11.25, we're still in the fullness of the Gentiles, period. Do I know when that's going to end? No, I don't. I have no idea. But it doesn't change how I live day to day. And I don't need to know when. What I need to know is that I'm supposed to be prepared. That was a great, great comment. That you, we need to just be prepared. We need to be ready. Right? That's the purpose. Um, Second Peter. Chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, it's like 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy Two, where it says uh, that God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God's, God's desire is that all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. And then uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians 15 12 already. So I think that's all I have to share about Micah chapter 4. Again, not in any way minimizing the prophecies, not at all. Only pointing out that the important part of prophecy is either the reproof it offers to get us back on track, or the doctrine that we're supposed to believe about a certain event, and that we're ready for the event, not when it's going to happen, because we don't know when it's going to happen. As we saw from Mark 13, 32, that Jesus Christ, the Son, didn't even know. Only the Father knows. He reiterates that in Acts chapter 1. Um, and I'll close with prayer, and then if anybody have any, has any comments or questions. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. We thank you for instructing us about future events and for helping us to focus on the important part of that future event, and that is that we need to be ready for it, no matter when it happens, because we don't know when it's going to happen. Um, I thank you again for these men, for their time, for their willingness to be here, for the priority they uh, set on your word in their lives. I thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.